Untamed. Welcome to the podcast, a People Thursday's edition of the show that aired today on the platform. What is the platform? Well, the platform is independent free media. It was begun May two years ago by Sean Plunkett and Wayne Rice, the other guys behind it. And they've employed myself, Martin Devlin, Lock and Water, to do a sports show every afternoon. IOS is the name of the show. It's only sport. This is the highlights package of today's program. We put together a couple of snippets from the interviews that we've done, some of the chitty chat as well. I invite you, if you want to listen to the whole program, to subscribe to Platform Plus. Three bucks so we can go back and listen to all of the free radio that we provide every day in full. Nine hours worth. On the program today, Justin Marshall, 81 Test Veteran, of the All Blacks, the best rugby analyst in this country. Greg Mato Martin, former Wallaby fullback, Triple M breakfast host. He joins us every single Thursday. We're talking about the anniversary of the underarm incident happened today, February the 1st in 1981. Craig Cumming and Graham Beasley from the Sports Freak website joining us as well as that Tom Rennie because there's a lot of Premier League matches over the last few days. But as always, ladies and gentlemen, we begin the show. Tablets in hand, I say gather my flock. It is time for a sermon. Never forget, Aussie. Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. The original saying was, remember the Alamo, as Texas fought to gain independence from Mexico. Well, today, it's remember the underarm. Never, ever forget. This day, 1981, Trevor Chapel. Instructed by his brother, the Aussie cricket captain, Greg, bowled the ball along the ground to Brian McKechnie at the MCG. McKechnie blocked it through his bat away, and the rest, as they say, is infamy. It was one of the most controversial, contentious, and talked about moments in sport ever, especially in any country in the world that plays cricket. So dirty, so low, so underhanded with every pun intended. Our then Prime Minister Rob Muldoon weighed in saying something like, it's appropriate the Australian team wear yellow, obviously referencing the international colour of cowardice. It also propelled the game into its own sporting stratosphere and ended up being the best publicity and promotion one day cricket could ever have bought and paid for at that time. You've got to remember, it was only a fledgling form of the game back in 1981. One day cricket had only been around for half a dozen years or more and internationally, it wasn't nearly as established or popular as it then became. Kerry Packer introduced the coloured pyjamas and the day night thing back in the 70s. Two World Cups had been played at that stage, but the first was 60 overs. So they'd only just by 1979 shortened it to 50 overs. So the rules and regulations, restricted fields, all of that hadn't really been established. The underarm was exactly what the game needed, even though at the time, of course, no one uh, could ever see the eventual positive influence that it would have. It also epitomised the Aussie attitude to cricket, that they will do anything at all, no matter what it is or who or what gets in the way to win. And on it goes. In recent times, sandpaper, the sledging, the Bearstow run out, back to Dyer the liar, Michael Clark threatening to, to get his bowlers to break a South African batsman's arm. It's who they are. They will do anything, everything, whatever it takes to win. That, by definition, is what playing cricket is to being Australian. Devlin. What do you want? We want information. Information. You won't get it. The platform. Let's do the headlines because Greg is waiting for us, mate. Hmm. What to start with? We'll start with the, the All Black schedule, which is out, which is great, but I did that, that sticks in my craw that we're not going to Fiji to play. I mean, and also the other thing is, is just in terms of All Black fans... A trip to Fiji, mm. how good would that have been for that island's tourism? How many thousands of people here would have gone, yeah. okay, I can afford to you can do form that? Some sort of yeah. trip packages around a resort, there you stay go. or something Dinner for New Zealand let's, fans. Let's, let's all Who do it. Who wouldn't want to do Who that? Who wouldn't want to do that? Who wouldn't want a trip to Fiji in May or June when it's gross there weather? There you go. Take the kids and it's all actually, and, and we're ploughing money into their economy. Instead, Mark Robinson. You come up with every excuse in the world, mate. Time That's... frame lapsed in terms of being able to make that happen. We, we drew back to one game and then ultimately we thought the, the best thing to do for a variety of reasons was to take that offshore to the west coast of the States. Oh, time frame lapse. Time... What? What does that what mean? What does that mean? I and mean, yet, the where's bo- the journalist saying, I'm sorry, sorry, Mark, what do you mean time frame lapse and, yeah. uh, and other options? And we, and we ran out of... 
Didn't you run out of time to decide that Ruby Tui didn't run New Zealand rugby? That was the same excuse you used that time, wasn't it? Over the Weepix cards. We ran out of time. We ran out of time. We ran out of time. I mean, a good chunk of that Fiji it's, national it's, side. It's February the 1st. The game's not until May. Mate, the, the, a big chunk of... Um, it's July, actually, to be July. honest. July. But still... Six months. It's further away. I mean... The bulk of that Fijian team, we saw it at the World Cup last year, a lot of those guys play for the Indrua, who, like pretty, well, every All Black, bar maybe Bowden Barrett or another guy or two who's in Japan coming back, play in Super Rugby with the Indrua. Exactly. So where's the where's the issue with timing? Oh, no, we ran out of time, mate. No, we ran out of time. Yeah. Oh, well, because, you know, uh, Silver Lake gave us a whole lot of money and we kind of have to do what they tell us yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. That's probably mm. what it is. Anyway. All right, this is the All Blacks schedule for 2024. We knew the, the bones, the rough structure of this, uh, I think, as early as late last yeah, year. Yeah, it was. It's always been easy. Oh, run through this as quick as I can. Okay, England, England, Fiji. Those are the three tests in July. Then the Rugby Championship. Argentina twice in New Zealand. Wellington, then Auckland. This starts in August. At the end of August, South Africa, in South Africa. And then at the start of September, South Africa, in South Africa again. Then we have Australia twice. Once in Sydney, then once in Wellington. Wellington get two Rugby Championship tests. Um, Those Australian matches are in September. Uh, to round out the month. Then on October, my birthday actually, October 26th, uh, we play Japan and Yokohama. November, we have four tests away to England, Ireland, France and Italy. Another thing that annoys me, why the heck are we finishing our year against Italy? Wouldn't you have that sort of between the Ireland and the France mm-hmm. match? Wouldn't you? Yeah, finish with France or Ireland. Uh-huh. What oh, no, I look, no, so, look, I've, look I've, I, according to Mark Robinson... Time frame yeah, we really lapsed in terms yeah, of being able to make that happen. Yeah, we we drew back to one game, so and then ultimately right, we thought so yeah, the, yeah, the best thing to do for a variety of reasons was to take that off short of the Johnson coast Johnson of the States. Right up my backside. Exactly. Sorry. We don't, you don't have any power. Sorry, yeah, Jonas. Mm. Anyway, moving on. Wood Rugby is taking legal action over the online abuse of players and match officials at last year's Rugby World Cup. Premier League, a lot of matches on this morning. Well, actually, no, there's only three this morning, but interesting, intriguing matches involving heavyweight teams. Uh, Man City, Liverpool, Chelsea, Tottenham all playing. Man City beating Burnley 3-1. Cruise control that match. They were in Man City. Uh, Tottenham beating Brentford. They were down 1-0. Then they were up 3-1. Then it was 3-2, but they held on to win 3-2 at home. Liverpool beating Chelsea 4-1. Dominant performance from my Reds. Uh, Tomorrow, West Ham and Bournemouth. Wolves, Manchester United on as well. In terms of the table, uh, not a huge amount of change. Liverpool have a five-point lead. They're on top with 51 points. Ahead of Man City, they're on 46. They and Arsenal tied on points. But City do have a game in hand. Assuming that game in hand, when they play it, if they win it, they will only be two points off of Liverpool. Uh, Tottenham sitting fourth. They're on 43 points. They jump ahead of Aston Villa, who lost yesterday. West Ham is sixth. Jeez. Uh, Chelsea, tenth after their defeat. The relegation zone is the same as it was yesterday. Everton, Burnley, Sheffield, 18th, 19th and 20th. Uh, the plans to expand the A-League men's competition from 12 to 16 teams before the expiration of the current broadcast deal in 2026 could be shelved, this potentially leaving a black hole in the competition's budget. Now, the APL has already given the green light for a franchise in Auckland to participate in next year's competition, we know that, and there is a deal for a uh, men's side in Canberra that is nearing completion. But according to AAP AAP, over in Australia, uh, these sources have indicated that the APL is privately hesitant about its hopes of getting two additional expansion franchises over the line. Just take it easy. Do two, have it for a couple of years, then do another two if it's going well. Uh, the PGA Tour has secured a 4.8 billion New Zealand dollar investment, that's 3 billion US, into a new uh, for-profit entity from a consortium of US sports teams owners as part of a deal that allows for co-investment from Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. Uh, England spinner Jack Leach is out of the second test against India, uh, this starting tomorrow due to an injury to his left knee. Uh, Formula One has rejected an Andretti Cadillac bid to enter as an 11th team in 2025, saying it did not believe the proposed outfit would be competitive or add value to the championship. Uh, And it's been an historic day for New Zealand at the Winter Youth Olympic Games, with two Central Otago free ski athletes winning gold and silver in the halfpipe. Luke Harold was the standout performer to take gold, with Finn Melville Ives just behind in silver, and what has uh, no doubt been a memorable day for those two, as well as snow sports in New Zealand. They were competing over in South Korea. Devlin. That is a disgusting act. The Platform. Justin Marshall, there is no better man to listen to talking rugby than this guy. Justin is in the UK at the moment. <clears throat> rugby back on this weekend. What a way to start the Six Nations with what is probably the final Ireland and France finished one and two last year, and Ireland go to France this year to kick it 
all off. Here's Justin. Well, I'm going through my, you know, must-watch sport over the weekend and top of the table here in New Zealand, 9 a.m. Saturday, France versus Ireland kicking off the Six Nations. Uh, You know, if you want to start loving rugby again, this is a good place to start. Oh, it certainly is. And and when you think that you've got, you know, the two of the best three teams in the world basically uh, going head-to-head in the first round of the Six Nations... You know, Andy Farrell uh, has just been named Lions coach, uh, but still taking the helm for Ireland. Uh, and when you think about the dynamics also of it, Marty, we, you've got uh, Dupont missing for France for the first time in a long time. Um, and equally, Johnny Sexton not in the Ireland mix. It's like you've got two of the key instrumental players and in key ma- uh, uh, decision-making jerseys that are now not involved. How will either team adapt to that? And, and you know, for me, it's fascinating that does the dynamic change massively? Like, it's you take a Dan Carter out of the All Blacks mix and all of a sudden it's it's a different team because mm-hmm. those those types of players are replaceable. But yet the, the remainder of the team is still the same. So the dynamic is the same. So fascinating game. You know, is it the decider of the Six Nations first up, first round, first weekend? Um, it's all set up for Friday night in Paris. Amazing contest. Yeah, a couple of things about that. Because of the Olympics, of course, DuPont not playing because of that. And also, no start to France. So different stadiums. So they're going to have to move these matches all around France because of that. And I want to get on to later that, you know, what does it mean that Farrell's out and DuPont's out? And what are players deciding that they'd rather actually earn some money playing clubs rather than or Olympics rather than actually for their national team? But first mm-hmm. and foremost... You know, it wasn't that long ago that we were at the Stade de France and that weekend, quarterfinal weekend, two of the best rugby matches that have ever been played. And these two teams on the losing end of those, you know, you could talk about Australia and their World Cup disappointment, but France and Ireland, those are the two teams that I think walked away from that Rugby World Cup just feeling shattered by it all. Yeah, they would have. And and you make a valid point. And, and, you know, honestly, the the Stade de France, how amazing was it? You were there, we caught up and... We saw, you know, what that stadium can bring, particularly to the French and, you know, the atmosphere, the environment and, and the way it lifts them. Um, you know, you, you take you take that away from a home team and, and then all of a sudden the dynamic changes. Uh, you take key players out of the mix as well and, and that has an effect. Look, it's, it's a really interesting transition. It always is, Marty. After a Rugby World Cup, we have this massive movement and we're going to feel that later in the year with the All Blacks, but at the moment, it's not the All Blacks have to think about it. At the moment, it's the Six Nations teams where players that have been so instrumental and so influential in the development of both of their nations or integral in, in the success of their nations do get old and do move on. And like in DuPont's, um, I guess, in, in his uh, defence, you know, he's not exactly old or over the tree, but he's wanting a new challenge. So he's moved on. And Johnny Sexton, obviously... You know, he, he's um, decided, well, he hasn't decided, but probably thinking to himself that, you know, that that was his last Rugby World Cup, as it seems to have been. Um, but you just never know with rugby. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't surface somewhere. These sort of things do happen. But the game, the game is interesting. And, you know, again, you take it away from a regular venue and you give Ireland a chance. Um, it's, it's just fascinating the, the development coming out of a Rugby World Cup where each team finds its feet again how they how they progress how they try to change the way that they were playing because it wasn't successful at the World Cup as you rightly mentioned two teams that were supposed to possibly even be in a final didn't end up there where are they going to go from now and how good are they going to be without some key players 81 Test Veteran of the All Blacks Justin Marshall special guest on the platform for us every week Justin, when you've gone to a World Cup and it hasn't worked out, uh, you've got to get back on the horse straight away. Uh, You've got to start winning test matches straight away. And it's really important, I believe, for the All Blacks this year, for example, that we we stop thinking about the World Cup in 2027 and we get back to what you've been talking about for years, which is win the goddamn next match and then win the goddamn next match after that because that's what it's built on. How important then for France and Ireland to to actually win this tournament? Um... Look, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I saw Andy Farrell's interviews during the week um, and he was basically saying, you know, like, this is the toughest tournament to win. It's really difficult. And, you know, they were sort of trying to label them as favourites, the Irish, but he was trying to play that down. But 
equally he was saying, you know, this is this is really cutthroat. And when you've got teams performing well, you know, like, to be fair, mate, I was super surprised by the performances of both England and Wales uh, in, in um, France at the World Cup. They, they were way off the pace in the Six Nations, but when it came to World Cup time, they actually performed really, really mm, well. So mm. when you think about those situations developing, it means that when you've got your big games, like we've got this weekend, obviously, you know, you've got this game um, between Ireland and France, but, you know, you've got England trying to front themselves um, again without Owen Farrell, um, without um, Marcus Smith, and all of a sudden they've got no 10 or a, a new 10 coming in. Um, but they had a good Rugby World Cup um, out of the blue where they got beaten by Fiji before the Rugby World Cup. It's like, it's just really strange to try and think, right, well, how does all of this piece together and how does it work? And how do you decide who's the favourites and who are not? And how significant is this game? Because you could be England or Fra- Ireland or France and win this game, but yet, there's still a team that could tip you up out of nowhere because the other teams seem to be capable. So, yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating to me how this is going to play out. Um, like, like you said, you know, for the All Blacks, we don't have to deal with that until later in the year. But these teams are facing it so quickly after the Rugby World Cup that they have to just get out there and see where they're at. And and what makes it really interesting is is the dynamic again of players missing players that are basically players of the decade in in the UK or in Europe um, that are not there anymore. And it just adds a little bit of spice to the mix. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. Oh my goodness me! The Platform. Marto, Greg Martin, every Thursday on the show, Triple M Breakfast host out of Brisbane, former Wallaby fullback, his breakfast show well there's a team of them on that show but it's the highest rating breakfast show in brisbane they do a man's show they talk about men's things i know ridiculous isn't it how on earth could that succeed i mean you ask the advertising agencies these days oh but it's not the right demo no it seems to attract hundreds and hundreds of thousands of listeners about time you apologized marto said sorry i'm not talking about australia day i'm talking about underarm day Today's February the 1st, Greg, and the the listers are waiting. The door is open. Public apology, yours. Oh, you're kidding, aren't you? This is the greatest day. It's a public holiday here in Australia. It's called Chapel Day. It's where we go. Uh, it's, it's where we go. What a great day it is to be Australian. And all you Kiwis can get buggered. There you go. <laughs> see, oh, that's oh, it. And we're sorry. No, but see, this is we're the great thing. We applaud this, you see, because that's your attitude. We don't care. Here, hey, hand us a piece of sandpaper and I'll rub salt into the wound with it. We don't care. We don't We don't remember anything about it. It meant nothing. You were just a, a little ant on the earth that we that stood on and moved forward. Oh, get over it. You're not serious, are you? Well, I actually, I look back with amusement at, at it now. Um, but at the time, it was a really big deal, wasn't it? Oh yes, it, it was a really, it was a big deal. Well, not to you guys. If anyone yeah. knew the chapel, everyone went, "Oh, the chapel's the royalty, the cricket royalty." Three brothers playing in you know the Australian team it was pretty big, but the reality was they were ruthless bastards. Yeah, <laughs> that's totally. That's what we wanted. And I think that was the day where we went. Um, a few people, you softies, and there's always softies, all went, "Oh, poor New Zealand, we shouldn't be so harsh on them." And the rest of us went. That's what you get in sport if you don't like it. And I think your All Blacks have taken upon us to uh, punish us. Every Bledisloe match since then has been some sort of wicked payback. But all right, sorry. Is that good enough for you? Say it to the Aborigines, mate. Don't say it to me. Oh, oh Devlin holds serve. Devlin holds serve. Hey, all right. Um, no, I haven't got anything to be sorry because I've lived here my whole don't get me started. Don't get me started. Welcome to country. Don't we get we, we have to do welcome to country at meetings, not not at meetings at radio stations, but at other places. And I go, can't welcome me. I've been living here for more than fifty years. I am part of this world. Uh, that's something for politics. I don't want to talk. Okay, about see, politics. but they tell you what you saying that because we've just had three hours to talk about it with Michael Laws because we got Waitangi Day yeah. coming up and our country just tears itself oh, apart, right mate. Right. But I mean, you know, you've got an attitude that hey, look, it's like say for example, let me just put this to you. Um, you know, I was born in Germany. My grandparents were, of course, SS and that. Oh, no, no here's, a, here's actually a better one. 
My great, 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 great grandfather was Jack the Ripper. Do I still get blamed for those murders, do I? How the hell can you blame me for that, for that, you know? But anyway. And that's that's logic. It was only last week it was Australia Day, and the greatest joy I've seen in Australians, are new Australians, immigrants, they go to the citizens, they become citizens. They came here because they saw it's their dream. It was their dream to come to Australia. They're so grateful and they don't realise why we're bashing ourselves up so poorly about it. Well, speaking about bashing yourselves up poorly, mate. So you no. played the West Indies in Adelaide. You beat them in, what, a, a day and a half. You, oh. you get to the Gabba. No. Uh, you're absolutely caning them. A guy with a broken toe who can't even walk, doesn't even take his kit to the ground, picks the ball up, and guess what happened? I loved it. I loved the whole thing, mate. The whole of Australia was um, cheering on the West Indies. I went out. I told you, I went to the cricket. I was yeah, sober. yeah. First time ever. Drove home. Real, what a weird thing that was. <laughs> what, driving home from bizarre, a what a bizarre experience. 30, you arrive home, you're not go drunk. Good God. Yeah, it was incredible. And you know what I saw uh, last Friday? It's <laughs> day two of that test match. I saw Australians making absolute fools of themselves and I've realised that that's what I've been doing for the last 35 years of my life is being a disgraceful, drunken person. And I'm back on it tomorrow. But anyway... Um, we cheered for them, mate. And you know what? You know what I saw was that we're self-satisfied and overconfident because we we've been the Pakistanis, or we're the world champion in uh, one-day cricket, and no, we won the Test, you know, won the Ashes. We're a little bit up ourselves. Mm-hmm. If you hadn't noticed, mm-hmm. I'm sure all you Kiwis. But it was it took that Test for us to realise we're over, up ourselves. We're all all our players were a little bit overweight, like there's been too many buffets Ooh, over the summer. Hello. They were lean. They were lean because you got to see them up front. You didn't just get what the TV station showed you on heart, at home. They were lean, hungry young men who, were, and it was awesome to see that they got the result, mate. It, it's got to be good for world cricket. You I remember know. the joy, the joy, the joy on the faces, even as the Test match was going on in day two. They had pure joy. They were just happy to be playing this Australian team, and then they beat them. That was, I reckon that was the best, well, this year's only been going for a month. That was the best sporting um, occasion and result I've seen so far because it made me real, I remember what sport's all about is hunger. You told us a couple of weeks ago. starting? Well, the Rebels, are they st- even starting? You told us a couple of weeks ago that the three franchises were in trouble. Now, so they're going to bail this Rebels franchise out for millions of dollars. No. Greg, no, no, okay, it doesn't, it doesn't make, well, only this year. So if they don't make money this year, then they fold. Is that is that the case? Well, they won't, mate. They won't make money this year, mate. I've been down there commentating members since the day they ran on the field, what's that, 10 years ago, and we said, oh, we've got to have a presence. Rugby has to have a presence in Melbourne because it's, it's Australia's biggest sporting city. Um, no, it doesn't. Let other codes have their run down there. League's just hanging on by its fingertips. We don't need them. Um, and so they're gone. They'll be gone after this season. They'll let them run this season. And then the force have got plenty of money, so they'll hang on. It might be the Brumbies that go next, despite the fact that they've won more Super Rugby Championships than any other team. So it's true, mate. Australian rugby's in a little bit of trouble, but we're just looking ahead, as I said to you last week, to the money we make next year with the Lions, two years later with the World Cup, and two years after that. So we've got plenty of rugby, big rugby coming up, but it's Super Rugby that's dragging the whole thing down. It needs to needs to be blown up and rethought. I, I would think. Is there same sort of thinking going on over there? Uh, I've got I've got a great quote to play. This is from Mark Robinson, the CEO, trying to explain why oh, you know we're playing man, Fiji he's and your, he's one of your best mates. And well, yeah, I, I, I have to tell you actually the story about bumping into him in France actually with his wife in France. But so so instead of playing <laughs> instead of playing Fiji in Fiji, the All yeah. Blacks, we're playing in San Diego. Okay, so you know here's like, here's an idea. Fiji, we all love oh. Fiji. We love Fijian sevens. We love the Fijian yeah, people. How about a whole lot of holiday package tours where New Zealanders, you can take the kids, dump them in a bloody resort, go and watch the test match, actually combine it with a holiday, stuff a whole lot of millions into their economy. This is Mark Robinson, right? They've been, this is, this is, this test has wow. been talked about since November last year. This is him. Time frame lapsed in terms of being able to make that happen meant we, we drew back to one game and then ultimately we thought the, the best thing to do for a variety of reasons was to take that offshore to the west coast of the States. Time lapse. I don't get it. What? What? what are, well, time lapse. What? We can't. It's, it's in. It's, it's in Fiji. July. It's in pull, Fiji. You and I. You and I could pull that off and, and say next Thursday there's a test. Uh, all back home Fiji. Yeah. And we'd have a full house. Mate, how, how, what, what would it take? I've got. A, I've got a travel agent friend. Yeah. Let's get some packages together and all make some money out of this, mate. It's a, it's just it, def, it defies belief, doesn't it? Here's a guy talking about fan Cedric and fan engagement. Why not give something back to the Pacific people and the Fijians, mate? Huh? Why not? Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you. Sivavatu, Siva Reese, every bloody player we've stolen off you, mate. Exactly. We owe them plenty too, mate. But that's the thing. Why aren't we doing it every time we have any game in Fiji? It's completely chock-a-block, and that's with them. Mm. You're right. The opportunities for us to pump millions of dollars into their economy, San Diego, for God's sake. Oh, no, San, San Diego. Like, this bloke keeps on... This bloke keeps on bumbling from one disaster to another. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. The Type 5. Five separate sporting topics, roughly a minute or so on each. And when the bell reminds us, well, guess what? We go on to the next topic. Uh, we probably talked all about this Fijian test being taken to San Diego. So let's look at the rest of the All Black test schedule, Lachlan. Stephen Perifetta, he wants the number 10 jersey. Yesterday, Bowden Barrett told us that he wanted the number 10 jersey, and Damon McKenzie's already said he wants the number 10 test jersey. So we've got a log jam. Who do you choose? Premier League, it's yours to lose now. I'm hoping, obviously, I'm invoking the spirit of karmic logic here in terms of sport. And I'm right on the reds now, man. I hope that... Liver, I hope... I, I, I can't say it out loud. Uh... Are you buying into the NRL Vegas hype like you're buying into the All Black San Diego hype, Lachlan? The underarm. From your generation, I'm really interested to know what do you know about it? What, what have you heard about it? Does it affect you at all being the anniversary of? And this New Zealand Athletes Union uh, scoring a, a win over the governing body, High Performance Sport New Zealand in the Employment Court case. Damn, I tried to read that article and I just got a headache after about the first three paragraphs. It's so convoluted and waffly and involved and I can't understand a bloody word of it, but we'll try and make some sense. First and foremost, the All Blacks schedule low 14 tests. Let's park the stuff about Fiji because we've harped on about that already. Uh, you already know what we think about that. The rest of the schedule I really like. I like two tests against England. I hope that they do bring a team that is going to be competitive down here. Or uh, three, if you count the one at the end of the year. Well, that's right. Uh, I also like the fact that we're playing Ireland and France at the end of the year. And I like the fact that rugby have got these test matches now in the rugby championship as their own individual series. Not the Aussie ones, of course, but we play Argentina twice here. We, we go to South Africa and play twice. I like that. Uh, yep, I do and I don't. Um, I, I liked what they did to the Tri-Nations when it was um, just three teams, but... I mean, the problem with that was when you had the All Blacks play South Africa, for example, and back-to-back -back matches in New Zealand, Australia wouldn't get any action for a few weeks. Um, so it's kind of good how they do it now. But what annoys me a little bit is just um, that we don't get South Africa and New Zealand. It'd be great to have one over there and one here. Mm, yeah. Um, because that would be a, just... A, I mean, okay. if you had that at Eden Park or you had that would, at Sky I would, Stadium... I would actually prefer, given the fact that the world champions have we played them three times, I think if you're going to add another test into the schedule, get yeah. them three times. Well, because usually we play Australia three times. Yeah. Um, um, and they've done that a lot in the past. And that, I mean, they've well, not done that, that this year, well, by the way. Because there's no interest in it. There's mate. no interest. Um, and I don't know, minor gripe, just because I don't live there, that there's two matches in Wellington, but Auckland only gets one. Also had a text in here, no test for Christchurch. Well, that's because you don't have a stadium, mate. Yeah. The fact, I mean, they never take games to Christchurch anyway. They do it once every four or five years because yeah, the stadium, with all due respect, is rubbish. Now, well, you're, no, getting, you're getting a great yeah, new one. you're getting one. a great new one. And, and when you have that, sure, you'll, you'll get tests. You'll get tests. Premier League... Wait, is Hamilton getting one? Are they uh, getting one of the England matches? Let me just have a quick look at that. I'm pretty sure you're right on that. One second. Uh, what about the Fiji? Oh, no, that's oh, right. Oh, no, that's not going there. Yeah. Uh, no. No, they don't get one either, mate. So where do England play? England play in Dunedin and Auckland. So Dunedin gets Argentina... So Argentina's in Auckland and Wellington. Mm -hmm. Australia... Wellington get two. Australia's in Wellington as well. Mm -hmm. Argentina, uh, sorry, uh, excuse me, England are in Dunedin and Auckland. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Well, why doesn't Hamilton get one? Oh, well, I don't know. And I don't do the bloody schedule, mate. Why isn't Fiji in Fiji? I know why. I know perfectly why. Time frame. Time frames and the lapses. We couldn't really get it organised in one game. And I've got the Silver Lake penis right up my rear end at the moment. And they're riding me like a horse. That's probably the reason. I also can't do my job. If I'm perfectly honest, yeah. I reckon, I reckon just quickly, one thing that they should be, New Zealand rugby should be pushing so hard for is get teams, uh, get, get tests in our five major cities before you give a city more than one. They should be doing that. There should be games in Auckland, Wellington, Hamilton, Dunedin and Christchurch. Obviously Christchurch, there's an asterisk next to that at the moment. But go to those three, uh, five cities before you give Auckland two or Wellington two. Premier League, Liverpool's to lose. Say it out loud. 
Pretty impressive no, against Chelsea to today. Lose. Pretty impressive. No. Uh, Man City got a win against Burnley. Uh, is it between those two teams? Or do you think that this fixture on Monday, Arsenal versus Liverpool, for it's going to be a hell of a game to watch. Yeah. I mean, and all that, we, after three, we're going to do a, a, a little look at some of the sport we want to watch this weekend, some of the sport we don't want to watch over the weekend. That game there, even though I don't like either team, I'll be watching. That's a hell of a game. You get through that. You win that game. Oh, if we win, it's on. It's on. It's absolutely it's, on. It's, uh, that's, I think you press pause until you beat Arsenal away. If you beat Arsenal away, then you tell me, give me a list of teams right now that are going to beat you. The only thing that's going to trip you up is the fixture congestion and maybe some injuries. Yep. Well, we've and got Man City, a, I, that, the, the, that, that, that thing called Man City. I agree with that, and I'm the first to say that I'm not going to sit. Like, if I, if I was put, told to put money on it and I had a gun to my head, I'd bet on City. Absolutely. Um, because we've had inj- a lot of injuries recently. A few guys coming back. The main concern is obviously no Mo Salah, but we have a lot of depth up front. And look, Darwin Nunes misses so many chances. He hits the woodwork all the time, but he does so much else. Like, he set a goal up to... And he goes hard, minute one to minute 90. So we still get results out of him. Um, the Arsenal game, if we lose, all of a sudden, absolutely, I'll sit there and say that they're back in it. Because if they win that game, they're only two points behind us, and assuming City win their game in hand, uh, well, I still think it's a race. There's way too many points left. Out. Okay, I mean, when you get down to six or seven games, you can actually say, is this team in or is this team not? And at the moment, how many games are left? Uh, 16. Okay, that's 48 for us points. And okay, 40. Arsenal, 17 okay. left for okay. City. There's still a fair few points to play for, right? But the form you're in at the moment without Mo Salah and with Jurgen Klopp leaving, it's pretty impressive, mate. Even I've got to say that. Yeah, we just got to, I think we've got to, we've got to tap out, we've got to tap out probably of the FA Cup and maybe the Europa League when it gets to about maybe February, March. Are you buying into the NRL Vegas? No, no see, neither am I. Uh, what hype? Is it making headlines over there? That's hype. Not here. It makes headlines here every year. Well, Tell me. It's, it's making headlines here because the NRL are flying a, a hand-picked bunch of journalists with them to go over there and enjoy the sights of Vegas yeah. and then write some good stories about it. Costo, more on this. On the bike, look, it doesn't need the hype as far as I'm concerned. Hey, it's a good promotional idea. Play it in Vegas. It doesn't mean league's got a foothold in the States. It doesn't mean it's ever going to get a foothold in the States. It'll be treated like the novelty it is in Las Vegas. They'll probably give away half the tickets. None of that matters to me. Rugby and it's rugby. It's kicking off the NRL, which I want, and I want it back. Yeah, rugby and rugby league have the same problem here where they're desperate to try and um, put a foot down in the US, and they've done it for years. And the NRL really started it when they took the Kiwis England test, I think, to Denver. Yeah, remember that national anthem? Yeah. The, most, the mm. worst rendition ever. But, look... You've got to understand where your success is. And this is what AFL does really well. AFL knows that they don't have a chance at getting big in any other country, really. They don't need to. They generate $5 exactly. billion dollars but the in NRL Australia. Does, yeah. The NRL's massive in Australia. Yeah. I can't imagine they're in any financial strife, no. apart from stuff to do with the pandemic. Understand where you're good and hit that harder. There you go. Don't worry about the US. You know what? I, you know, this, is, this is the uh, analogy I'll give you. You're a really good jeans shop. Yeah. So why have you decided to start selling burgers? What? what, what? Why are you do, do you think you can beat McDonald's? Do you honestly think you can? Why have you put a drive through burger thing into your jean shop? The underarm. So in 1981, sitting there in up a hut in the house with mum, dad, her brother, sister watching that, just horrified at the time, going, what? Now, this is this series, let me explain the series for you, Lachlan. It was a five-match series. We won the first one, Hadley the Demon, and that's where the chant came up from the, the bank in Sydney. Hadley's a... Starts with the W, rhymes with Tanker. And he was an absolute weapon and a destroyer. They won the second one. They won the third one. I think this was the fourth one by memory. It comes down to the last over. Bruce Edgar was unbeaten on a century at one end. Uh, Richard Hadley got absolutely just, it's a sawn off. I mean, it was just the worst LB decision you've ever seen. If you watch it now, mate, it's so far down leg. So how the hell he get, anyway. Uh, it comes down, Brian McKechnie. Now, the only thing with McKechnie was is that because he'd kicked that goal in 78 against Wales at the death when Andy Hayden dived out of the line-out to essentially win us the, the hardest test in that Grand Slam, that there was this kind of aura around him that, God, that's the same guy. He's wandering up with a cricket bat. I mean, he's a miracle man. Maybe he might do a miracle. This is the dots people were connecting, right? Mm. Now, it's the first ball he's going to face. He's got to hit it over the Melbourne cricket ground boundary, which is like 100 metres longer than every other boundary in world cricket, Mm. on the first ball he faces to secure a draw, not a win, Mm. a draw. And so Trevor Chappell bowls the ball under him. So I saw it, I lived through it, 
every year. I've thought about it when February the 1st comes around because I get reminded of it and remind myself about it. But your generation, this is just a myth of time, isn't it? No, what does it mean to you? Well, I was negative 16 years old. So what does it mean to you? Well, it doesn't mean anything because it happened before I was born and it happened in a sport that... I'm not a good example of this. It happened in a sport that I didn't really get into until I would started working for Radio Sport because I just never liked cricket and then now I've actually come to quite like it. So for me, it's just a... It's an infamous moment in New Zealand sports history that I never personally witnessed and one that um, that really tees off a lot of fans here still. And I can imagine, as Greg Martin proved to us, do, uh, proved to us earlier, that the Aussies don't care. No, the thing is, they never cared. Yeah. They didn't care at the time. And he though. described it really well. You were just an annoying little ant. Yeah, that's it. So what? Who New are Zealand? you? What? Um, I mean, that's why Kerry O'Keefe and those guys made those comments the other about week domestic cricket. about domestic cricket here in New Zealand. It's a joke to them. Yeah. They don't even consider it. It's like us talking about Australian club rugby. We just keep... Yeah, come what? On. Come on. Well, come on. Come on. Um, You're not serious, are you? So I'm not, I'm, not a great exa- I'm not a great example of someone who looks at that angrily or fondly or whatever because one, I wasn't around and two, it's just not a sport I got no. into either. The New Zealand Athletes Union. Now, we spoke... A couple of years ago to Mahi Drysdale about this when we first started the platform, remember? Yep. And they were taking this to the employment court. Um, and apparently the athletes have won a victory about collective bargaining. So I just You try and read the article and, oh, my God, it's like it's worse than reading the new, the Old Testament. You sit there and you've just, I just can't make head nor tail of it. I'll t- I tell you what, on that, just quickly, and this is one thing I really noticed about journalism when I started um, doing some work for The Herald. Some journos are determined to make what they write so ridiculously difficult to read. And it's like, it's, I don't know if they're trying to prove their intelligence something or something. Like that, yeah. And I sit there going, look, your readers are laymans to this sort of stuff. Can you make it Can easy you make, for them okay, to so, understand? Yeah, outline. What is the point of it? What were they trying to achieve? Yeah. Why is it important? These are the questions. But the only question I have for it, and, okay, if the athletes win good, is why the hell is High Performance Sport New Zealand engaging corporate law firms spending our tax money fighting our athletes. How is that good for anything to do with New Zealand sport? Yeah, yeah. You know, high performance sport New Zealand, you wankers, it's not your money you're spending. It's our money you're spending. That money should be going to the athletes, not fighting the athletes. That's the only point about that story that I want to make. Finally, Perifetta wants the number 10 jersey. I applaud the fact he says it and out loud like, I applaud the fact that Damien McKenzie says it and says it out loud, but I don't want either of them starting in the jersey. As I, as I said yesterday, if Bowden Barrett's fit, I want him in the jersey. I would like him to teach these guys how to play first five for the All Blacks because they're probably our next two best at the moment. Yeah, definitely, yeah. But the way that that story is run across the media is though it's, it's, it's a reality. It's not a reality. Oh. Maybe against Fiji he might start. Oh, I don't... I don't know. The, At first, uh, the, five Perifeta, the, come on, the, uh, mate. The article I saw on News Hub didn't suggest that News Hub were writing it to say, oh, here we go, here's our answer. It was just a, this guy saying he wants the jersey and here's why. I don't, oh, look, I don't think it was as bad as what you say. But I agree with you. I don't want Perifeta playing first five first up. Now, if he comes off the bench, has a couple of good performances, has a good Super Rugby season and he's building, sure, give him a shot against Fiji, give him a shot against Italy or Japan, and then if he plays really well, okay, let's maybe start playing him against some of the bigger teams. But um, I, I, to me, like, uh, yeah, the same as you. If Bowden Barrett's healthy, he starts. I don't. You, it's it's as if you've got Cristiano Ronaldo and you've got I don't know, Dimitar Berbatov. Look, Berbatov is good, but if Ronaldo's healthy, yeah, he starts. And you've got one other guy to put a, up front. That's you it. start Ronaldo. That's you start. That's Devlin. Platform. The bloody underarm, mate. You've got to be kidding. The underarm. Were you alive? Were you around? Were you at the time compass mentis enough to feel the wrath of that? It is enduring. Never forget. Bowling a ball underarm. And you've got to remember that even if McKechnie had a hit of six out of the ground, it only would have drawn that game. The Prime Minister's got involved. It took sport from the back page to the front page. It was probably the best thing ever to happen to international one-day cricket. And today, we remember it. Craig Cumming and then Graham Beasley from the Sports Freak website. I just wanted to briefly touch on today in 1981, uh, and I say it with, you know, with amusement in my voice now, because at the time, of course, it was, and we were also goddamn angry about it. What do you remember about the underarm? Uh, I, I, I sort of remember it happening. I mean, I was six. Um, and um, I remember it happening... 
Um, and I probably what I actually remember most was that was it the catch from Martin Sneddon? Yeah, um, yeah, same game. And, yeah, yeah, and and that was the one that probably stuck out for 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 a long long time. So yeah, at the time I remember, I don't remember my reaction, but obviously after that, um, you know, gained momentum. And I suppose the biggest one was even out in the backyard. I mean, would you have done it in the backyard? Well, you played. That's how we played all our cricket back then as young kids, and and you never even thought about doing it. So. Um, you know, it was it was one of those ones. It was a, a mark in the sand, I suppose. Moving forward, it created that relationship with Australia, and you know, divided them. So, um, you know, it just shows that even back then, people had challenges around what they're doing. And that other one that always stuck out to me, Marty, was the wicketkeeper, um, Rod, Rod Marsh. Marsh. And all I remember him is going, "Nah, mate, nah, mate." And, and for some reason, I think that's one of my memories again is him just doing that and going, "Well." Clearly, they're not all on board, but it also showed Australia will do anything to win. Um, and that's how they've just held it, and they've always had that. Devlin. Yeah, the next rule. The platform. More on this story, the underarm platform. Graham BC, Sports Freak website. I just wanted to catch up with you today quickly on the underarm because it is February the 1st. It's one of those least we forget moments, especially for New Zealand sport, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Um, 43 years now. Um, which, is, which is quite a long time, but we still bring it up. Um, maybe because it's quite a distinctive date. You know, it's the first of a month, um, so it's quite an easy date to remember. But, um, yeah, we haven't got over it, um, which is a bit odd because the whole thing that's amazed me about the underarm is that if Trevor Chapman bowled it normally, overarm, there's no way Brian McKechnie was sitting there for six in the first ball he faced at the MCG with the, with the rope right on the boundary. Um, so I think that's kind of part of it. It was, it was almost like a moral victory that they had to do that to win a game, whereas really they didn't actually have to do it. Well, you've got to remember also that if he had hit a six, it only drew the game. We couldn't win, yeah. we <laughs> couldn't win the game. That's the thing, Aussie. So it, th- th- that was what was so peculiar about it, even at the time. Yeah, and there were the other things that happened in the match, the Sneed and non-catch. Mm. The fact that Richard Hadley was given out in that last over with a ball that pitched miles outside leg stump and he was given out leg before wicket. Um, you know, there, there were other things they did on that day too which were just a little bit dirty. And the excuse that they didn't see the Sneed and catch because they were looking for the one short. Now that's a yeah. Well, if you can believe that, you can believe anything, right? And nowadays you see all of the changes that have happened since that that could never happen now because you've got cameras, you go upstairs, you, yep. you've got the TMO, all of that kind of thing. Um, but plus, it was, look, it, it, it actually catapulted that sport, didn't it? It was, you know, even though, because I look back at it with kind of a bit of affection now. I mean, it's it's, it's amusing it now. At the time, it was, it was outrage, but I don't feel like that, obviously, after 43 years. <laughs> Are you over it, are you, Marty? Well, I don't you know could, if I'm over you, it. You're trying to convince, yeah. No, look, I, look, I, and I like reminding them of it. But, you know, Graham, all it's done also is just reinforce since then, before then, they will do anything to win. What has changed? No, no, absolutely nothing. And there have been worse things since then. Um, you know, they hadn't um, claiming to have, uh, you know, uh, Broom was bold and, you know, hadn't uh, took the bales off. And they've done lots of things since then. And and they do keep on doing it, but there was just some, something about the underarm that it did capture people's imaginations. You know, the two prime ministers got involved that's it. and had their, their yeah. reckons on it. I mean, that, that's pretty rare for anything in sport, for the prime ministers to get involved. And you're right, it did catapult the, the popularity of the game. They they came out here the following season and someone got into Eden Park and rolled a bowling ball at Greek Chapel and, um, you know, we loved it. And, and we did them and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it, that, that was a golden era of, of one-day cricket. Um, and, of course, we were also made to play in that awful beige at that time. And that it, was all because of Channel 9. Isn't that perceptive as well? That was the golden age because we're as one-day cricket now. You see, who would have thought that? I mean, it is now relegated yeah. way behind T20. Yeah, it is. Um, it is struggling. I still think it's a good format. Um, you know, the games evolve as they go on, and you can't really say that about a T20. Obviously, test matches evolve even more, as we saw a couple of really good cases of that last weekend. But, um, yeah, there, there, there was something about one day cricket, and it just seemed new and fresh, and, you know, the games were played under lights in Australia. You know, it still took us another 15 or so years to, to get that going over here, but um, there, there was, and, and the grounds were just packed out all around the country. It's especially when, when it was Australia or England that were touring. You know, it was really hard to get in. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a really popular sport. Most of the, that team 
in 81, you know, the likes of Bruce Edgar, Smith Hadley, etc., they will appear on TV ads. Yeah, you know, yeah, a, they yeah were, you're right. Yeah, you're, they do that. Cheesy ads. Che- terribly cheesy yeah, ads. Terrible. They, they they weren't quite at the um at the the air conditioner stuff that Stephen Fleming did, but they were you know Bruce Edgar selling I think renter cars and yeah. things like that. You know they were all on ads. So I'm sure Love Plants Gens was on an ad. Um, Hadley was on multiple. Um, none of them award were awarded um, Oscars or anything like that. I don't think for their for their acting in the ads. Premier League, Premier League, Premier League. It's just been such a stop, start, start, stop, stop. Stop, stop, start, start, stop, start season for the Premier League. International breaks, winter break and everything else. Good God, are we finally into it again where we can just get weekend after weekend of fixtures over the last couple of days. Just about every single team in the EPL has been playing today. Liverpool certainly stomped it over Chelsea and cemented the fact that not only the top of the table, but they are there to win that title. Man City also won, but it is Liverpool who are setting the pace, as Tom explains. Liverpool just marching on after the Klopp announcement. They're looking pretty strong at the moment. Well, I'll tell you what, I think the Jurgen Klopp farewell tour is going to be very, very hard to stop. And the Arsenal game on Sunday at Emirates Stadium is going to be just a must-watch encounter for any football fan around the world. I mean, look, They have no Mo Salah at the moment. Uh, Went off to AFCON, got injured. We're a couple of weeks away from from seeing Mo Salah at least. It was such a cruise against this Chelsea team. Look, they're a mid-table team. They might have cost a billion dollars, but they're a mid-table team. So it's a result you'd expect. But it's the way Liverpool always look like they're going to score goals. It's the... The, almost the embarrassment of resource they've got. I mean, they've lost Trent Alexander-Arnold for a couple of weeks, right? He came back on tonight. He's been replaced by this uh, Northern Irish teenager, Connor Bradley, who was at Bolton last season, was, was voted their, their player of the year. Um, Academy product who went out there on loan. He was sensational. He was the best player on the pitch. He scored his first Liverpool goal, which had shades of Gerrard to it. Two assists in the game. The second one uh, across the Sabah slide to wrap it up the three was fantastic. You know, they can score goals for fun at Liverpool. They've got so many resources. They can even afford Darwin Nunez, the agent of chaos that is, to have 12 shots at goal, none of them go in, and he missed a penalty, and they still won by four. You know, it's they score goals, they defend well, they've got this clop factor, they've got the cop factor. It is all lined up for them to go on a bit of a march here, and... The weird thing about it now as well, because Klopp has, has, has said he's going to go, is that there'll be more people willing them to win it now than maybe there was. It was not Man United, Everton or you know Arsenal or City fans, but your neutral football fan listening to this right now might be thinking, yeah, that's a good story now. I'd love to see Klopp go out with, uh, with a bang with a title. And if they play as good as they did tonight in games moving forward, I think that will uh, will only gather steam, that narrative. Well, Man City back. Haaland makes uh, his appearance again after injury. They're five points behind. They've got a game in hand. Arsenal are same points as Man City. Those three teams, well, is it just the two teams, Tom? I mean, can we talk about Arsenal? If Arsenal beat Liverpool on Monday, yeah, we can talk about them. But I still think it's a two-horse race, is it? Um, I think you've got to wait till that game. I really do. I think if Arsenal were able to beat this Liverpool team with this momentum, then we have to talk about them as contenders. The issue with Arsenal continues to be, as we saw against Forest um, on Tuesday, that goals are going to be hard to come by. That isn't the case for City and Liverpool. And I do think they are third favourites in that group, but we'll have to see how the weekend goes. But in, in terms of City, I mean, I, I watched the first half of the game against Burnley. I didn't see the second, but... They just, they, they just have this total control of football matters at times. And a few years ago, I think Klopp was, uh, even Guardiola even was playing to, to entertain, to thrill, to give um, his critics, certainly after that first season where they won nothing and finished fourth and scraped into the Champions League. I think there was a couple of years where he was trying to thumb in the eye of those critics. Now I can play football and win. Now he's won everything there is to win. He's almost given up on entertaining people like me and you, the neutral. Uh, and he's just thinking about winning and winning and winning with a crushing inevitability. And that's why they're not winning 7-8-1 and eight, one, like they were in those old days. They got the second tonight. They scored a third. Burnley pulled one back. But when the second went in, the game was over. They shut it down. When City get the second you might as well start thinking about getting the bus home early to avoid the crowds. Um, and it's they're just a machine, an unbelievable winning machine. And 
you know, it's going to be interesting to see when we eventually find out about the charges hanging over Man City. But the embarrassment of riches they have to be able to bring on Kevin De Bruyne, Erling Haaland, these talents. A couple of weeks ago, it was Jeremy Doku off the bench. They have an extraordinary strength in depth and they're going to be tough to beat. But as I've said to you every time we've spoken, the title race in this era will take over 90 points. It was a rarity at one point that would be required. Now it's a necessity. And I think we're going to get one, maybe two, possibly even three teams over 90, which would be amazing. 51 points, Liverpool after 22 games, and City and Arsenal sitting there on 46, as I said, and City got that game in hand. Is the top five the top five? Liverpool, City, Arsenal, Tottenham, and Villa. There's an eight point gap now back to sixth place. Get that, people. Sixth place, West Ham. And you're talking about mid table sides. Man United in ninth, Chelsea in tenth. I look at that pack of five. Hammers. Geordie's Brighton, who who got, I want to talk about getting thumped by Luton, but Man United, Chelsea, maybe Wolves, because if Wolves actually win at Old Trafford tomorrow. But there is uh, seemingly a breakaway at the top. Is that right now? The only teams I think I would guarantee European football for are the teams that are currently in the top four, and I would guarantee the top three will qualify for the Champions League. Uh, The rest, I I think, we'll need to see. I, I think there's still doubts about Tottenham, despite their... Uh, victory over Brentford uh, on Wednesday night. I I think West Ham are still in that mix because despite being a bit ugly on the eye, they do do get a lot of results. The game against Bournemouth for them on Thursday is going to be really interesting. Uh, 10 wins in 20 is nothing to be sniffed at for for West Ham. And if you've got Mohamed Kadus, Lucas Paqueta, Calvin Phillips, James Ward-Prowse, um, you know, Jared Bowen, they've got a really good first team, West Ham. So they could cause a bit of damage. Villa, I, I think the loss against Newcastle on Tuesday was very damaging for them. I, I think they'll qualify for Europe, but I don't see a Champions League push in their future. Chelsea were awful in the game against Liverpool, and I'm reliably told by Chelsea fans they haven't played much better in recent times. But if Nkunku stays fit, he might score enough goals to get them top six, maybe top five. I, I don't have much faith in Manchester United. I don't have much faith in Newcastle United right now, but it's, it's a wide open race for what's likely to be eight European spots. And I think only one of that top nine is going to miss out. If I were to pick one, I'd probably say Brighton. We need to talk. A brand new game. We need to talk. Which we're going to do round about this time every Thursday. It is called What to Watch. Next. I'm going to give you my top three picks from the weekend's upcoming sport to watch. What not to watch, Lachlan. You can follow my Next. top three. In no particular order, but these are the three must watch, which I will will not miss. One of them, Six Nations, Ireland, France, 9 o'clock, Saturday morning. Got to watch that. That is the best sport going, I reckon, this weekend. Absolute A-list. Next! 5 o'clock tomorrow, India, England, first day. Not the whole day of the Test match, or probably what, but the first session, first couple of sessions, what kind of picture India going to produce after the Test matches that we saw on Sunday. I'll also be watching 11 o'clock Sunday, the first couple of hours of New Zealand versus South Africa. Next! Premier League. Now, not my miserable lot who are playing against Wolves tomorrow (laughs) and then West Ham on Monday. I'll endure those. But what I'm really looking forward to, Arsenal versus Liverpool, Monday morning. And I think that's a 5.30 kickoff. 5.30 a.m., yeah. 5.30 a.m. Those are my top three then. Ireland, France, Six Nations. The two tests, I'll watch a good hour of those. Premier League, Arsenal, Liverpool. Won't miss any of that. That is the best sport on for me this weekend. Next. Yours. Uh, my sport to watch. Well, I've got four. Roll them. Mm-hmm. Six Nations. I'll say Ireland, France, but also Wales, Scotland. Okay, I accept so that. give, uh, what do you call Scotland? The mix? Is that what you call them? Jocks. The Jocks. Who mix, are the mix? Mix are, mix are Iron. Iron. What are Wales? The Joneses? Taffs. Oh, the Taffs. Next! Uh, that game would be great, and I'd actually, um, I'd, I mean, for betting people out there, I'd put some money on Scotland to get a win there, even though it's in Cardiff. Um, day one of South Africa, well, day one and two, because, well, day one, two and three, because we have Monday, Tuesday We've got a long off. weekend we've coming, long people, because we've got the Monday off, so we won't um, be back to Wednesday. But day one, two and three of New Zealand, South Africa, specifically, Black Caps, it is specifically how... Because Kane Williamson's playing, isn't mm-hmm. it? How he looks, how Rutch and Ravindra looks good, yep, yep. after a good spell of form last year. And Kyle Jameson, I feel like we haven't seen enough of him just thundering in with some absolute pearlers. Against South Africa, Zed. Next! 
Yes. Uh, I've also got the Phoenix against the Raw. Yeah, good call. Tomorrow night, away in Brisbane. Again, it's the march towards the minor premiership, or just the premiership as the A-League call it. And if the Phoenix can keep it going with a the win, they've been good away from home. Um, so I'll be getting up, or getting up, staying up. Staying up. Watching that game. Okay. My those, no watches. Those are your top three. Yeah. Give me the those no watch. My top three. My no watch, domestic cricket. The Ford Trophy, and I'll endorse that too. I won't be watching any of that. And New Zealand cricket, you've done this because yeah. of the, the no, the fact you don't give a stuff about the competition at all. You don't care means I don't care. It's not. Yes. It's not anything against the players or the coaches. No, not of at course, all. it's purely an NZC no, thing. And it. I, it, it's not riveting, which is unfortunate at all. Um, there's not. Really, I mean, there, there's a number of golf tournaments on the weekend. Won't that be watching those. Yes. Just nothing to really get. Excited about maybe I won't some be watching Kiwis any playing. of the T Twenty BS comps going on around the world no. at the moment. Whatever they yes. are, whatever they are. Now, I'm going to say a no watch to ESPN if there is just an overload of Taylor Swift content. Now, I'm not anti Taylor Swift. I'm not anti her at all. I'm anti Taylor Swift taking over sports headlines in the US. So, if ESPN at one moment, New Zealand ESPN or ESPN2 decides to start playing stories about her scheduling issues with her concerts in the Super Bowl, will Travis Kelsey drop on her knee and propose if they win? I'm not interested. Okay. I'm changing Next. the channel. I won't be watching, finally, anything to do with the NFL Pro Bowl. That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, one to four, Monday to Friday, Download the Platform app, and via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure. Platform Plus. First thing to do, though, is download the Platform app. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The Platform.